Hello, welcome. Oh God. <laughs> Hello, welcome to Framelines. We're back with a Q&A video. So we're answering questions that you've asked us like six months ago or something. We took ages putting this one together. For anyone that doesn't know, what does Q&A stand for? Q&A stands for questions and answers. So you've asked us some questions and we're gonna give you some answers. Thank you. Was that your question? <laughs> that's first my, question, that's first my, question out of the way. That's my only question. So to start with, um, we have our first question which I'm going to field to Josh. Um, how important is the process of making photographs versus the end result? Good question. Did you write that one? Yeah, I wrote that one. Thank you for that, Shay. The importance of the process. I, I've talked on the channel before about how I love just going out to take pictures for the sake of taking pictures. Of course, it is nice to actually take some pictures you're happy with at the end of the day, but there have been times when I've absentmindedly formatted my memory card after a full day of taking pictures and lost everything and thought to myself, oh well, I got some exercise, had a nice day out. Does it really matter? So yeah, I think for me, it is really important to actually enjoy the process of going out with a camera. I think once you start to enjoy it, that's when you will take pictures you're happy with, I think. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I think the end result is quite important. Yeah, of course. But I think the end result only comes about like you said, if you're happy doing the process. Yeah. For me, photography is so much about momentum and being confident. And to be able to build this momentum and be confident taking pictures, you have to enjoy the process of taking pictures and practice the process of taking pictures. So it all feeds together, I guess, when I yeah, start to think about it. Definitely. I think part of the process as well is, and I found this recently, is Organize things like organizing your photographs, organizing what you've shot in the past, yeah. going through it with a critical eye and finding photos that work and putting photos together in sort of a theme. All of that stuff that is part of the process leads to the end result. So. Good. That's nice. Yeah. I enjoyed that. I like that. <laughs> what you got for me? I've got a question for you. That one? Yeah. I've got a question for you, Shane Taylor, it's aka Heroes for Sale. Spontaneous. And do you have any tips for someone wanting to start taking street photographs? Yeah, like, I think we get asked that a lot, right? For people that are just getting into street photography and they want to know, like, how do you do it? I think the biggest obstacle for most people is getting over the confrontation aspect of it, hmm. where you just have that fear built up um, of people maybe attacking you or hitting you or swearing at you if you take the photograph in public. Um, my my advice for that is really just to do it and try and try and respect people. I think maybe start off with a longer lens so you're not getting in people's faces. I think like one of the worst things you can do is go straight in there with a 28 mil lens, not knowing anything about the etiquette of street photography or the etiquette of photographing people in public and being incredibly obnoxious and rude and not caring about people. I think that's the worst approach you can take as a beginner street photographer. Some people do it, but I wouldn't recommend it. Um, yeah, so if you, I think if you try it and you do it over and over, then I think you should maybe stay away from what you see online mm. and avoid whatever's popular and just do it in terms of getting something that's, that you find interesting. That's you nice. think? Yeah. I mean, I also think, I mean, I started out shooting a lot of events, like turning up to protests and dog shows and places where you walking around taking pictures where the camera doesn't look at place. Like, I think that, I think those are good, play, good ways to practice, I think. Do you think? Yeah, absolutely. Because people expect you to take photos of things like that. So they're not, you know, they're not going to be angry. I think it's, it's probably easier. Right? Yeah, it is. And you can, you know, smile and say thank you. And, you know. Yeah. I like... Um, I like going to things like that, like parades mm. and just photographing around the parade, like not necessarily photographing the float itself or people watching the parade, but you always find something mm. interesting around them. For sure. Is there a decade that you would like to go back to and photograph? I think that question was meant for me, but I'm going to ask you. <laughs> <laughs> Probably the 80s. 80s? Okay. 80s. I really like the idea of being as into photography as I am now, but taking pictures in the 80s where there's just no expectations of Instagram or social media, 
just shooting film, all the kind of like vibrant colors and outfits of the 80s and the hairstyles and just doing nothing but photograph. I suppose, yeah, my whole thing, maybe this is more based around not having social media. Yeah, it sounds like it. Like, <laughs> I often think, holy crap, like when you think of Matt Stewart and how he photographed for 10, 15 years without Instagram, without social media, without the constant proof of putting out the work mm. people verify it they say it's good and then you continue with it and just like having all that time to develop it yourself yeah that's more i think that's more like maybe that's more what i'm thinking about photograph anytime just not have to worry about instagram i do i love instagram that, that's the thing we'd have never met yeah never we did never met maybe that's why there'd be no frame lines <laughs> <laughs> and the world would be better off <laughs> i'm gonna ask you that question Okay. Is there a decade that you'd like to go back to and photograph? Yeah, I think uh, probably for the same reasons. Like I think about how Robert Frank um, used to live with uh, Louis Four in New York. And they would, uh, they lived in an apartment together for a short period of time. They had tons of cats, they had developing uh, gear. So they would take turns sort of going out to Times Square and photographing, come back. Uh, they would print and the other person would go out and photograph then and it was just like a an incredible cycle it was a new a new thing they were doing at the time because street photography wasn't even mm. wasn't really a name on it I think um, so that sounds exciting and also just being able to photograph the world or New York in that time period as well I think would be pretty interesting all about New York aren't you? <laughs> Do you go out shooting with a theme or series in mind? Probably not. I think for the most part, for me, like a project or a theme or a series has come about naturally as a result of shooting over a period of time. I'm very conscious at the moment that I've published a book about street photography and I'm kind of like draw a line under street photography a bit, or not draw a line, but thinking about what's next. And I've been stressing out about that for a bit, like what do I do now kind of thing. But then I've just realized that it will just come out naturally from just going out and traveling around a bit, trying and photographing other things. I've been trying to take portraits of people. Mm. Set myself a little goal of taking one portrait a week or a month, for example. But yeah, no series in mind. I think it's better for it to come about organically, do you think? I think, personally. So do you mean like uh, just sort of going out there, taking the photographs and then putting a theme together from what you've taken? Sometimes that, but I mean, going out there, taking photographs, looking at the photographs I've enjoyed taking, looking at the ones, maybe seeing if there's something I'd like to explore, yeah. and then being like, okay, I will explore this and maybe go out and purposely take these kinds of photographs. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, I'm working on something like right now, like I've told you about it, uh, but it was the same thing. Like it was just me noticing a pattern in mm. photos I've taken. Yeah and putting photos together and then thinking, okay, that's kind of a cool thread to follow. Mm. And then purposefully uh, going to find locations that were like that and just building it up into a series. And that's your new garden center project. That's my new garden center project. It's coming in uh, 2026. Is there any point in shooting film in 2021? Uh, yeah, I think there is a point in shooting it, but I think it's incredibly expensive. So there's also, I think there's very good reasons not to shoot it because it's so expensive and not just to buy the film, which like Portra has probably increased a hundredfold over the last year. Is that true? A hundredfold. <laughs> well, we, I looked the other day and it's in, in four years, it's gone up 75% in retail price. Yeah. I mean, it's so expensive and to develop it on top of that, to get it scanned yeah. and to get it scanned at a, like a good quality. And the chances of actually having anything good on the roll. <laughs> yeah, especially if you shoot street photography, because yeah. with street photography, you get like one good shot per hundred, per thousand almost. Mm. So yeah, it's not like I can see why people shot film in the past, like there was no options to them, mm -hmm. but it was also so much cheaper in the past to shoot film. I use motion picture film. Oh yeah. Yeah, like Kodak Vision film, which I bulk roll and that was the system I figured out because it was a lot cheaper. So, yeah. Um, shooting film, there's definitely a point to it because it's it's got a unique look to it. I think over most things you can get with digital, I think you can kind of fake it with digital, but there's some things you can't fake. 
Mm. Like the sweet tones. The sweet tones. Yeah, you can't fake that in digital. It's true. What do you think? Do you, you've given up shooting film altogether. For the amount of pictures I take, it's just not economically viable. Mm. And I can get my pictures to look how I want them to look di digitally. I like cine still. I really like shooting cine still. I've got a few rolls saved up that I probably will shoot over the winter. But it's taken me probably about 20 rolls of cine still to get to the point of scanning it that I'm happy with. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what was that? It's just such a, uh, just thinking about the money I've spent. Yeah, it's just, for me, it's not viable. And it's a pain. It's a pain just to use practically because you have to archive it, you have to buy folders, you have to make sure it's all, you know, all your information is together. It's so much easier to do that with digital, I think. I just have loose negatives in a tote sack. I bet you do. I do. I, I bet he's not even exaggerating. I do. Yeah, he does. They're all in this tote sack. Yeah. <laughs> That's horrifying. Back in there. How has starting a YouTube channel changed your photography? Um, I don't get as much time to do photography anymore. Do you? No. We talked about this, about how I think it's difficult to be a photographer and to try and market yourself and to build up a YouTube channel and to build up an Instagram account and social media accounts. And now you have to do Twitter because everyone's doing Twitter now. So just finding the time to take photographs it's really hard now when are we going to get a tiktok yeah i was asked about starting a tiktok recently have you uh no no i haven't i'm still working on my moves i got to practice my dance moves first and then yeah yeah see i, I can't do that you gotta do that no you told me you could do that <laughs> i think it's meant less time photography but i also think photographically it's probably one of the best things i've done personally i don't know if you feel the same yeah the no, I, the, yeah it's been satisfying yeah it's really satisfying i like shooting photos knowing that they're going to end up in a youtube video instead of in a tiny little frame on a phone screen on instagram yeah that's nice especially i think for you because there's so much information in your photos i love that you can have it landscape on youtube yeah i do like that i do like that but it's a lot of work it's a lot of work. I think um, there's also the pressure of shooting for Instagram where you feel like you have to do it every day. Yeah, yeah. But with YouTube, because there's such a long life to a video, you could take like 10 photos, put them in a YouTube video, and you know that it's going to last for a couple of weeks, a couple of months. Yeah, and doing People, one video a month is acceptable. Yeah. Like what I mean is that you upload an Instagram post and it's it's dead within a day. Yeah, People yeah. aren't going to see it after a day. That's true. But a YouTube video has a longer lifespan, so that's kind of... That's good. If people like the video. Yeah. If it doesn't bomb, like this one is <laughs> like definitely one. good. <laughs> no one would have made it this far into the video anyway. <laughs> Do you think it's important to try other genres of photography? Because I know you've been trying portrait photography recently. Yeah, I think, I definitely think it is. Like, I think about how John Morowitz mixes it up with portraits and landscapes and large format and street photography. I find that when you maybe try a different genre, you maybe learn skills you can apply back to your street photography or applying compositional techniques you use in street photography to taking a landscape photo. I yeah. think it's all photography at the end of the day, isn't it? So you can overlap and I think all the technical skills that you pick up while learning different genres, you can apply across any kind of photography, I think. Yeah. And like you've been doing some commercial work recently, right? So. I found that like if you start shooting fashion work, you start to compose more intentionally. Mm, yeah. That can feed into into your street photography. You start looking more um, at light on faces and trying to make an image more beautiful. So I think that all sort of feeds in as well. Like any sort of any sort of commercial work, like product shots, can mm. probably influence. I think like from years spent doing street photography and seeing how light behaves on the street and seeing how light affects a scene has really set me up for learning how to light a studio, for example, or lighting products. Like, yeah, yeah. Because um, you've built up a visual language, right? Yeah. And you know what looks good. It's sort of an instinct, I think, at yeah. that stage. So I think, for me, photography is just photography, and you just, but, I, that's, wow. Oh, <laughs> wow. <laughs> that was really profound. <laughs> what was I trying to say? Photography is. Photography is photography, man. <laughs> 
Oh my word. What was I gonna say? What I was trying to say was, oh, you've ruined it. <laughs> <laughs> Photography's photography, the end. What else can you say about photography? What else? I mean, it's photography. How do you deal with negative comments online? I remember mostly have mostly just talk me down from getting upset. Yeah, like when we started <laughs> YouTube, we were preparing for the negative comments to come flooding in, and it's really been more of a trickle. <laughs> <laughs> it's been more of a trickle, and we get the occasional thumbs down, which gets to us. But I think. Like we try and respond positively for the most part. I think recently we just sort of ignore it, right? It's a bummer. <laughs> yeah, it's a bummer. If you're leaving negative comments for no reason, you're an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it just like, it's just hard for me to understand why someone would do it. That's what I end up thinking about, but it's just, but I don't know. It is what it is, it's part of it. Yeah, I, I read a book about how to um, control social media in your life. It's by Jason Lanier, I can't remember the title of it. But he talks about the 10 different things that social media is causing, like the 10 different problems it's causing in the world. And one of those problems, like number three, is social media is making everyone into a terrible person. <laughs> because we're always looking for attention and some people, their only way to get attention is by like, leaving a negative comment and trying to stir mm. stuff up. So like whenever I see a negative comment, I know where that's coming from. I know it's got nothing to do with me. It's just they're dealing with something in their own life. It couldn't possibly be anything to do with me. Couldn't possibly. No. And that's that. <laughs> is there anything we can use from that one? This is gonna be our most negatively commented video. Yeah, for sure. So do you have any favorite recent photo book purchases? Um, I don't have a recent photo book purchase, but one I always mention. So if you've missed a video where I've mentioned this, um, I'm going to mention it again. Planned at all. <laughs> uh, Frank Horvat's Sidewalk is one of my favorite. Um, it's not just a photo book. What I really love, and I'd love to see maybe a full format photo book um, that had something like this, maybe from a couple of different photographers, but it's just seen the diaries from. Um, from Frank Horvat as he's thinking about street photography and working through his process. I think it's really interesting to hear from someone like him mm. as he developed his photographs. So that's why this is one of my favorites. Uh, I'd recommend picking it up. But yeah, wouldn't it be great to see like a, a big book like that with diaries from a bunch of different people? That whole edition with the diaries. Should we, should we read, should we find one? Yeah, go for it. This is gonna be now be a dramatic reader. <laughs> I don't know what, sorry, I just grabbed this out of your hand. Oh, they're quite long, aren't they? They're quite long, but now you've committed to it, so you gotta do a dramatic reading from Frank Horvath's Sidewalk. I am stuck, not even a roll of film today. I'm accustomed to an indistinct New York beyond 10 meters, like a moving photo. I know how to point the camera towards areas where I sense an interest, which then in the viewfinder becomes clearer. Yeah, it's pretty profound. <laughs> Yeah, but can you imagine a diary entry like that from someone like Bruce Gilden? It'd just be totally mad, wouldn't it? What would yours be? Mine would be my my picture bombed on Instagram today. <laughs> yeah, mine would be complaining about YouTube comments, I think, <laughs> for the most part. Yeah, so have you, uh, have you come across anything recently? He has, because I see books right here and I, I'm prepared for him to talk about it, so. This I bought a couple of months ago, and it's called Taken From Memory by Sharon Rupp. I think, I say everything's my favorite on this channel, but this probably is one of my favorite photo books I own. It's a collection of pictures taken in the United States over 25 years. If you can pick up a copy, I definitely think you should. It's just absolutely stunning. Yeah, I don't have a copy. I only heard about her today, actually, one, and, and saw some photos from it. Um, it's incredible. Yeah, so that's a, that's a Q and A. Um, sorry for taking so long answering the questions you submitted about six months ago, but We've got to a couple of them. If there's anything that we that you asked and we didn't answer, um, feel free to leave a comment. We'll respond in comments. Yeah, great. Thanks for watching. Please do like and subscribe. Please subscribe. Please subscribe. Please. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Bye bye.